Well, hello everyone! This weekend I will be starting not one, but two new playthroughs over on Twitch. Friday we'll try to beat Factorio without our patches. We'll need to steal all of our resources directly out of the cold hard claws of the biters. This is gonna be a hard and unique kind of challenge, both military wise and I have it from hearsay that the biter economy is collapsing hard and runaway inflation will make it impossible to progress if we're not careful. And on Sunday we will start with the long awaited 10,000 science per minute challenge. Yes, finally! I couldn't do it on my old laptop, but thanks to my incredible supporters on Patreon, I have been able to upgrade my rig, especially for this 10,000 science per minute playthrough, which has been in the top results of my what's the next playthrough polls since… well since I started making polls over on Patreon. So join me this Friday and Sunday for a chat and a laugh on Twitch TV slash Mike Handy and you can check out my scream schedule in your local time zone on Twitch TV slash Mike Handy slash schedule. I'll see you there. Alright, what was happening again in Warp to Rio? And once we start on the very last technology, the one that will forever disable the auto warp timer, I think that despite my stupidity, I will make it. Nice. But wait, is it actually that nice? Okay, so we may be disabling the auto warp timer. But what good is that gonna do for me? That just means we'll be stuck on this planet until the end of the game. Post purple signs, post yellow signs, post rocket launch, heck, post multiple rocket launches and thousands of space signs even, before we have a shot of warping home. And all the while, pollution output and bite revolution won't ever reset anymore. It's already higher than it's ever been. And within minutes, we'll be knocking on the door of the bulletproof behemoth biter. We are not ready to deal with those guys, and while sure, they won't attack my war platform directly, they will attack my miners, and the war platform's pollution cloud will continue to grow steadily for hours and hours and hours, swallowing our miners no matter how far out we build them. Our troubles are far from over. In fact, now that we've locked ourselves for the rest of the game on this highly bite revolving ultra polluted planet, I'd say our previous problems are gonna pale in comparison to what is about to happen. Next time. Alright, so warp timer disabled. That's great man, but now what? We are stuck on this planet with no chance of warping out in hours. And within minutes evolution will reach 90% and our miners will get bombarded by bulletproof behemoth biters. All the while our power plant is eating through our coal supply like no tomorrow. But hey, at least that problem will solve itself as the power plant is about to completely run out of water. That means we've got three main objectives to complete ASAP. We need to find a way to defeat behemoth biters before evolution reaches 90%. We need to find water for our power plant. And we need to unlock nuclear power to drastically lower our base's coal consumption. My strategy guide shows I should go for 3 more levels of bullet damage immediately with absolutely no delay, because that will push the gun turret's damage output above the minimum damage required to tickle behemoth biters. With 21 damage, it'll still take several hundreds of bullets to take down a single behemoth. But our current 11 damage is not enough to overcome their 12 armor. Ha! 
However, playing Mike wouldn't be playing Mike if he wouldn't deviate from his carefully planned out plans a bit, and as it turns out, he happens to think he's got just enough water left in the storage tanks to research the boiler floor water technology. It costs a whopping 1000 red and green plus 500 blue signs, and all we get in return for that is… a tiny amount of water being warped over to the boiler floor. What? Mate, are you sure that's worth it at all? Never mind needing to be prioritized over urgent tags like behemoth bullet damage upgrades. Well, so be it. Between episodes I noticed a single missing pipe in my oil cracking facility, which fully disabled oil processing by clogging up the system. So after placing that pipe, all of the advanced oil refineries start working again to fill up the partially depleted petroleum gas buffer. Which means we're using even more water. Using up my precious limited water to fill up 3 buffer tanks of petroleum gas may turn out to be a major mistake, as we may need that very water to keep the base running for the time it takes to complete the boiler floor water technology. Despite playing Mike seemingly realizing that given his anxious mouse wiggling, he goes all in on reaching boiler floor water on our current water supply, and on the tech being any good at all, so who are we to question him? Anyway. We also bring the empty barrels we prepared to be filled up with lubricant, so that oil processing will consume even more water. Well, we're all out of steel again, meaning that engine production for blue signs will grind to a halt. We have a couple hundred stocked in these steel furnaces, which will stop gap the situation. But given that we have tons of iron stocked up, Let's give steel production a serious temporary boost. That will clear up some space in our iron buffer chests to keep our single yellow belt of iron production going, because soon our iron needs will greatly outnumber our iron production. While we are waiting for our urgent bullet damage techs to complete, which in turn are waiting for our not so urgent boiler floor water tech to complete, as we could have just skipped that tech and simply connect some offshore water pumps to our mining platform to get basically infinite water into our base for free, we have ample time to upgrade our greatly grown harvester floor with the full version of the new blueprint, containing a way larger storage area to accumulate iron and copper plates. But first we will find out what the heck that boiler floor water tank actually does, as we descend into the basement to watch it complete. Wait, what? It places actual water patches into the boiler floor? Mate, that's not a tiny amount of water at all! If we can place actual offshore pumps directly in the boiler room, that means we no longer need a giant buffer tank of water. In fact, given that we can place 8 offshore pumps in total, we can get up to 9600 water a second in here, which is way more than the water consumption of an average end game base capable of launching rockets. Well, I'm still not sure if this needed to be prioritized though, as the slow damage upgrades will take a long time to complete and we are a mere 10% evolution away from reaching behemoth biters. Back up to the harvester floor, which besides the massive plate storage buffers, will now contain semi-automated steel production. We just need to feed iron plates into the chests, and after that the steel is automatically belted into a buffer chest, which after 400 steel is stored up for personal use, will automatically feed out steel on a new belt up to the factory floor. Nice! We are not rich enough to afford limitless steel chests just yet, so instead we recycle the stacks of iron chests we already had for the iron plates buffer. And after quickly making a whole bunch of fast inserters, 
The iron buffer chest area is complete. Horn to copper, which is annoyingly almost symmetric, as the final feedout inserter outputs on the left side of the south facing belts, insensitive to the need to scratch your itch for symmetry. Anyway, both the input and output priority lies on the plates coming from the smelters, only feeding the overflow plates to the buffer chests. And only accepting plates from the buffer chests when the furnaces cannot keep up or are temporarily out of use due to moving the mining platforms later. We catch the exact moment the steel buffer chest exceeds 400 plates. So from this moment on, we are supplying the engine and red ammo assemblers on the factory floor with steel automatically. And Blue Science production should be able to meet our demands. Speaking of furnaces temporarily being out of use, and with the biter scientists nearing their technological breakthrough and breeding brutal behemoths in their little biter bases, we need to move this iron mine out of the dense pollution cloud of the war platform. Even while most parting biters don't manage to spot our iron mine hidden in the forests, some of them do. And the mine will disintegrate destructively at a deceptional degree, the very moment a bellowing of behemoths will lay their eye on our iron mine. So we do just that, recalling the iron mining platform from inside and escaping back out through the copper mine teleporter. Just as we prepare to zoom off, three big biters collect for an attack. Well, those beefy boys have just one eighth of the health of a behemoth biter and are way worse armored on top of that. And still the gun turrets needed a significant amount of time to deal with them. Yeah dude, that is exactly why the ammo damage upgrades were on top of the priority list rather than that boiler floor water technology. With behemoths now just 7% away, let's hope we still get there in time. Alright, so the new iron mine is indeed located outside of the war platform pollution cloud, but its own pollution cloud will quickly start to anger the large nearby biter nest. Let's see how that goes. Back inside, we see the bases lacking red signs out of all things. That is because Warptorio's damage upgrade consumes 3 red science packs at a time for one unit of research. So let's switch to vanilla damage instead, which requires all science packs in stacks of 1. And with the doubled science consumption time of 60 seconds, the labs will eat through red science 6 times slower for a while, giving us time to buffer a bunch of red science again. Well, it must be snowing in heck. Because finally playing Mike is gonna make a strategy deviation that editing Mike approves on. We are preparing to buffer up extra iron ore, but there's a few problems to solve before we can achieve that. First of all, our mining platform simply doesn't contain enough miners to supply much extra ore, but since we are done warping, we won't need to move the mining platforms much anymore. So why not expand the iron mining a bit around the mining platform as well? It takes a 100% productivity bonus for these 30 iron miners to be able to supply a full red belt of ore, but our miners are giving 110% 24-7. 
So yes, we will need to upgrade to a red belt to bring home all the bacon, including upgrading the entire belt past the furnaces. Yes, the entire belt, as all of the furnace inserters will prefer drawing off the near side of the belt, which means by the time the red belt passed all the furnaces, the near side of the belt will have been drawn completely empty, while the far side will remain untouched and will still be completely compressed. And yes, not taking into account inserters preference to draw from the near side of the belt when combining and redistributing supply belts is likely the reason your perfectly calculated megabase isn't working properly, so go fix that. Anyway, with a perfectly compressed red belt of ore now, we will be pissing off the locals twice as much. But where the heck are you gonna put a second furnace line? This floor looks quite fully filled already. The logical solution is to route the ore into the basement, build a nice furnace stack in the space just freed up by deconstructing all those water tanks, and route the iron plates back up. But no, that would involve not enough hand feeding. <laughs> and as we have learned by now, Playing Mike seems to be obsessed with hand feeding setups. But fear not, dear viewer, there are still plenty of nooks and crannies in my blueprint to fit in some nice extra chest fed furnaces. With iron ore being twice as bulky compared to iron plates, each furnace will need its own iron ore supply chest, but we can combine the output of two furnaces into one chest. And with a little bit of stuffing and cramming, we've got ourselves 10 extra iron smelting furnaces, which will be greatly useful in keeping the steel smelting furnaces supplied with iron, as it doesn't look like the main iron smelting line is going to overproduce iron into the buffer chest array anytime soon. Nice. Well, we've got our power plant water sorted, but that only means we're going to run out of coal soon, so we're going to need to make a coal mine. The problem is, we've got only two mining platforms, and they're both in use, so that's not an option. We're gonna have to do it the old fashioned way, the way of the early game, and mine coal outside straight into chests. We've spotted a coal patch not too far away from the copper miner, and there's uranium nearby too. So let's hop over and out of the copper warper, and head out into the unknown to explore the lands. Somehow we luck out and find not only a stone patch nearby, but even another coal patch right next door. While it is even larger, the smaller coal patch seems to be located better, near a small forest and slightly further away from the biters. So tiny coal, I choose you! We are going for a circular coal mine containing 20 cool coal members, not because we need that many coal miners consistently, but because I want to bulk mine a boatload of coal fast. The thing is, since we cannot use the above ground warp platform teleporter, we have no way to bring home the black blocks other than to drive out here and manually maneuver as much coal as our car can carry from out here to the nearest mining platform teleporter. Wait a minute. We actually can use the warp teleporter. Or at least to a degree. While we cannot use the warp chest logistics, we can use the power warping capacity of the warp teleporter to power yet a third location on the map. I failed to bring sufficient gun turrets to protect the coal though, so instead of defending both sides inadequately, we focus all defense in the north. Counting on the southern forest to block our pollution drifting out to the southern biter base. 
we go pick up that loot chest for no other reason than to waste a little time so our coal miners can produce at least a little coal for us to take home. And so it occurs. By the time we are back, we've already collected over a full steel chest of coal. Not bad. Well, not bad. That actually wasn't even enough to refuel all our furnaces, let alone supply the factory floor. So we steal most of the remaining coal from the power plant to finish the job. We will need to make several more time-consuming coal trips soon. With all furnaces fueled, we can afford to distribute the first extra iron ore to the new furnaces. With careful consideration fueled by years of experience and totally not a lucky guess, we randomly decide we have enough iron ore to supply 1000 ore to each chest. And somehow it turns out to be exactly the amount of available iron ore to the stack. Nice! Well, with Behemoth Biters being barely 2% evolution away now, we are burning through military signs like a some funny proverb, and our stone brick supply is stacking sin. So we will need yet a fourth mine out there to fend off our foes. But before we set foot outside for finding and founding our stone mine, we steal steel supplies from the base. And prepare to make some of our great green friends with all of the red chips we managed to stock up so far. I'm not talking about behemoth biters. I'm talking about efficiency modules, which normally would be a joke in Warptorio. But as we are mining outside of the immense war platform pollution cloud, for now, those will actually level up our miners' stealth skill, which will lead to fewer scary attacks on our miners. Or so we hope. Well, out we go. And we just so happened to spot a suitable stone mine location moments ago. Well, that will have to wait, as we first need to make a quick coal hauling trip to keep the base from blackouting and the blue signs flowing. Somehow we again come at exactly the moment enough coal has been mined for a full car and inventory. Nice! The coal pollution is indeed reaching the northern nests now, but the southerners are still woefully unaware of their village forests being polluted. We'd better hurry up with those efficiency modules, especially given that behemoth biters are now less than 1% away, oh my god! And just a few minutes later, with evolution at 89.6%, we managed to finish the third and last damage upgrade. One raw damage gun turrets is where we're gonna be for a while, and while that is sufficient to tickle the 3000 health behemoth biters with 8 damage per bullet, that sounds nowhere near adequate to deal with attack groups of, well, any number of biters which you could call a group basically. We are literally seconds away from, seconds away from entering the behemoth biter era. But are we really ready for those fearsome foes, or are we just sticking our head in the sand and telling ourselves against better judgement that everything is gonna be alright? Find out next time.